Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway in a brand new day. Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for April 9th, 2024. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network feed or on our dedicated Open the Voice Gate feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You could find us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box that says sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one time or reoccurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Mike Spears. Join alongside, as always, your other host, Case Slow. In case we are now basically two days after WrestleMania weekend, everyone, at least from my knowledge, is back in Japan. Dragon Gate in, in USA happened once again, returning for. 18 years, you know, the 18 year anniversary of 2006. But we're kind of like, in, in a lot of ways, case I feel like the two of us we're still kind of piecing together our Mania Weekend impression. But first and foremost, how are you doing, buddy? I'm okay. You know, Mania Weekend is always an interesting time. I was talking last week when we did our Mania Weekend preview about how, you know, the last five years of Mania, probably, I've been a little, you know, uh, dissatisfied with the indie scene and the the rise of game changer. And, you know, that's a promotion that just doesn't do a lot for me. And obviously, you know, I, I'm not into NXT and I'm not into mania. You know, I haven't watched a mania in a few years. So this weekend at this point in time, you know, there, there are a few glorious years there, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, and even, even more recently where mania itself was a bad show and the fan base knew it was a bad show and it was like, you know, it was a good weekend for me as somebody who makes my rooting interest very clear, which is, uh, you know, not exactly if this is your first time listening. It, it's not a pro AEW stance. Uh, it is just a firmly anti WWE stance. I, I like when I see them lose. So the last few years have been enjoyable for me, but this was the ultimate player haters weekend for me me getting annoyed at people having a good time, me getting upset at people watching and enjoying shows. Am I alone in that thought process, or do you agree with me? Well, like, for me, some of it is the fact that before I even, before we knew that Dragon Gate was going to be in Philadelphia, I already made uh, plans I was not going to break. So I was like, all right, this is another WrestleMania in a row in a row where I'm completely disconnected to it. After last year, I basically moved by myself across the country over WrestleMania weekend. It was something where I never really caught up on WrestleMania last year. So the fact that this all happened and like all these things were happening up in Philadelphia, I was in the uh, Western Carolina mountains and I was getting like intermittent messages, like touching base with you with this. And it was something where by and large, I get back to Texas yesterday, which I guess would be kind of like people head back for the after mania thing like this. And I've spent basically from 
uh, getting onto the plane and, and until now trying to catch up, trying to make sense of it. And it was a big thing over here yesterday that there was the solar eclipse. Of course. Coming, no, I hear you. Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, I know that y'all had that as well, but it was something where like, I feel like that it's been like this interesting bizarro world that i've been kind of like putting the pieces back together like a detective in a way like yeah trying, oh my god like, it's, it's, it's... like trying to make sense of ben k not showing up for a day <laughs> going from that to oh rio saito is selling an eight by ten that looks like it is a blood warriors one yeah yeah, yeah yeah um that's funny you say that because you know during the week like sunday through thursday i go to bed at nine o'clock so i get up so early for my job uh, so Thursday you go to bed at nine and then Friday I was so tired that I, I went to bed at maybe nine 45 or 10. And so w- like waking up and Saturday was the same way. Like I still went to bed really early. So you wake up and you're like trying to process results and news. And it's like, wait a minute, the young bucks are doing what on dynamite? Like every morning, just the first scroll through Twitter was just so, so chaotic. Now to be clear in my hating, you know, if you if you enjoyed Spring Break, more power to you. You know, we'll obviously talk about some of that show in just a second. My hatred is towards Mania and and the people uh, watching and and lapping up Saturday and Sunday. Just bug the shit out of me. I can't tell you how bad, Mike. And I'll tell you a, st- a story here, real quick. I can't tell you how bad I wanted Roman and Cody on night two to suck. I, all I wanted when I woke up Monday morning was to see that people hated it, that they didn't finish the story, they didn't stick the landing. Oh my God, that's all I wanted. It, it, it would have brought me so much joy just as somebody that just does not like what they do at all. Instead, what happens is Sunday night, and I, I just told Mike this story off here. I won't go into a ton of detail here, uh, but my dog on Sunday night was brutally and viciously attacked by two off-leash dogs in the neighborhood. They attacked my girlfriend and my dog. Uh, girlfriend is is fine, the dog went through very traumatic injuries. She's stitched up. She's doing much better now, but Sunday night into Monday morning was some of the tougher hours I have ever lived. And we are sitting at the emergency vet in Chicago and I'm sitting beside this dog who is just cut beyond belief. and has these awful wounds and is shaking in pain. It's just the, the, the most terrifying thing ever, but we were in the emergency room lobby for about an hour at this point, and I see the girlfriend check her phone, which gives me the all clear to check my phone because I don't want to be the first one to check my phone in a, in a traumatic emergency situation. But she opens up Instagram. I go, well, you know, let me let me take a look at Twitter real quick. And as that's happening, is when Cena comes out and Undertaker comes out, and I see that for their fan base, the main event on Sunday is exactly what they would have wanted. Didn't seem like my thing, but they were they were feeding into their audience. And as I'm sitting here with what I think is going to be a dying dog, the thing I love most on this earth, there was a part of me that was so annoyed, so annoyed that the Sunday night main event connected with that audience. And, yeah. and, and boy, did it. It, it. It's something that I guess I think that and not to get too much into like a W WWE stuff like that. Uh, I felt like always when I did more active coverage of AEW with everything elite, I always felt like I was the big Cody proponent in a way. I, I would I would concur as somebody that was consuming a lot of that content. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was something that like my big takeaway in a lot of ways was like, oh, this happened. I'm like, well, I'm happy that like the story happened and like it was like the satisfying thing. Like I, I, I thought that in a lot of ways, the Rhodes family got kind of a bad rap in AEW. Mm -hmm. And I still kind of do. I was like, okay, then that's it. And then I just felt so disaffected at a certain point until, and and, and this is the way that my brain is wired. This is the way that you kind of treat it from a player hater standpoint. I take just such an above macro view of world wrestling entertainment and have just basically distilled it down to the things that actually matter, which are it's uh, uh uh sec filings basically for me <laughs> and like that kind of stuff and i'm like all right let me see I- I- is this the brandon howard thurstoning of america maybe <laughs> but is it kind of for me for someone who has no interest whatsoever in the wwe product but does have to have a tangible kind of interest in what that what the industry is doing yes so like i sit around it goes like and it goes like cody Rhodes sells one million dollars of a merch over the weekend i kind of go like hell yeah that's kind of rad 
And that's like my one positive thought about the weekend is Cody sold a lot of merch. Yeah, it's uh, it's not it's not good. I I was I was very annoyed by it. I work so my best friend at work is like a guy who used to do talk uh, sports talk radio in Philadelphia. He worked for a, a big talk radio station there, um, and he he's a lapsed wrestling fan. I mean, if you ask him about wrestling, he's going to go, I love the rock and stone cold, you know, and he also loved prime UFC. He's just like a guy who just really loved t- media from 20 to 25 years ago. Um, 1999 it, was very important to a lot of dudes. Mike, that is so, so fucking funny. You said that real, real quick aside, we'll get to drag it here in a minute, <laughs> but you know, on the, the morning show that I work for, we've started doing a bit, because I haven't seen any classic movies. Like, I, he makes movie references all the time. And even if I, you know, I'm great with old music, I'm great with old TV, I don't know movies at all. So we've started doing a thing where I'm doing a weekly classic movie review. And we did The Matrix last week because it's 25 years old and I'd never seen The Matrix. And we dedicated an entire segment. All he wanted to do was talk about how awesome 1999 was. That is something that happened less than seven days ago in my life. Um but he is a, is a lapsed fan and knows I'm into wrestling and knows I, all he knows is I'm a little pretentious about it. And so, you know, he asked me on Monday, Monday morning, he's like, you know, should we, should we talk about WrestleMania? Like, it seems like something that like our listeners would be really into. And I start going off on, you know, just how much I don't like it or whatever. And we happen to know, and I'll, I'll use this term loosely, but we happen to know a content creator that was at wrestlemania and uh through that we started talking about emily may for sports kita and i showed him the video of emily may crying in the press box and this is a guy who when he did sports radio he wasn't walter cronkite like he was like the personality on the station you know he's not exactly a writer for the athletic but uh, he's to, to throw out a name that i think maybe five listeners might know and you probably have heard the Gordon Keith of mm-hmm. the team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he, you know, he was he was the shtick guy on the station. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, and Dallas Fort Worth Sports Radio, we have a term for that. So yeah. <laughs> but had still, you know, has gone to press conferences and has been in press boxes and, and is aware of the general demeanor that should take place there. And I showed him that video, and he was aghast. He go he, he like so honestly just goes, "Oh my god!" Like. She can't do that. What is wrong with her? And I was like, you would be shocked to know this behavior is actually being applauded, if anything. You know, this is the level we're at now. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is something where there are at times that, like, I have to, like, take a moment and go, like, it's not me that is going crazy right now. It's yes. everyone. Th- this and, is somebody and, and with I'm, no... I've already been crazy. Like, <laughs> it can't get much worse. So it's everyone. It's everything else. Because when I saw that, I was like, are we re- it really? Like, I I went to school for, like, sports journalism. Like, I know about all the dumb uh, clubhouse rules, you know, and all the club press box rules. Because there are, like, especially in baseball and football, dumb rules about the press box. And, like, that's the wild thing about... As soon as, like, they started bringing people into WrestleMania like this, I, we should have anticipated the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, this is somebody with no context of Dave Meltzer, no context of Tony Khan. He barely knows the Vince stuff that's happening. He does just not knows know that... what Reseda is exactly. other than a suburb exactly. in Los Angeles. Th- this, is, this is a guy who, again, you know, he said to me, he goes, hey, it was awesome The Undertaker came out. I go, eh, I guess, fine, I'll, I'll let you have that. Um, But just knows what it's like to be in a press box. It was aghast at that behavior, and I, I figured you of all people would enjoy that, and maybe maybe a listener or two did, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, but WrestleMania, it was a thing that happened. Uh, Dragon Gate was around. We're going to talk a lot about that uh, leading off that. ETU unlock the unexpected with Dragon Gate, as well as Case. Ray Day Parejas, we're almost done. Block play is over. The math that we attempted to do last week has come to fruition. It's a big old week, but let's talk more about WrestleMania, Case, man. Yeah, let's let's do it, because... Uh, by the time both people have have heard this, the uh, Ray Day Parejas finals would have happened. So our bulk this week will be WrestleMania stuff, and uh, we'll do a huge Ray Day Parejas recap next week. Absolutely. So Dragon Gate returns to uh, WrestleMania weekend for the first time in really eleven years. Uh, of course, we have their appearance at GCW Joey Janela Spring Break, trying to revitalize the uh, six man 
tradition going on there. A 10-man tag with CMLL at the WrestleCon March Hitchcock Memorial Super Show. GCW versus uh, NJCW versus the world. I did not catch that one. Just as a heads up there. And but and the rest of it, I uh, big takeaways case. My big one that I have just to kind of kick us off here. Nothing was more at display more than WrestleMania is not what it was the last time these guys were here. Like that was like my big takeaway between all the matches and all the Shun performances in particular. Not the year where you'd have three weeks, three matches over three days and you go all out. WrestleMania has kind of evolved, and I think we kind of saw at least a little bit Dragon Gate kind of, I don't want to say struggle, but like kind of be forced into this new paradigm that's so completely different from what things used to be. Yeah, I mean, I was so surprised, and I, I haven't watched the DDT show yet. That's really the last thing on my list. I mean, I, I'll, I'll try to get to Abe and Nomura. Uh, by the way, if you're listening to this, please remember... If you signed up for streaming services for WrestleMania weekend, this is your reminder to cancel them. If you don't want them, pause this show, go cancel Please everything do. you need to, and then come back to us. I, I, cause I am reminding myself to do that right now, but don't, don't blame case and Mike. If you did not cancel your <laughs> IWTV subscription. And I'm going to keep my IWTV subscription more on that later. Uh, but my, my Triller presents fight app is uh, that, that one's being canceled and with all due respect to our friends at High Spots, I am I'm going to let my subscription lapse there. But I was surprised at how easy it was, as somebody that wasn't traveling, somebody that was home, had limited responsibilities for you know Thursday, Friday, Saturday, at how easy it was to keep up with everything. There just there wasn't a lot of depth. It's not like IWTV ran a ton of shows. It seems like the fight side of things. That was way scaled down, and High Spots only had the one show. You know, they weren't doing Pancakes and Pile Drivers. They weren't doing a USA versus the World show. They just had the Super Show, and that was that was kind of shocking to me because I said this last week. You know, my only knowledge of the weekend going into it was just whatever the Dragon Gate guys were doing, and you know, I've kind of developed into a pattern that every year I, I figure things out as I go along for that weekend. But you know, Saturday afternoon, I was like. God, I'm, you know, I must be forgetting something. You know, I, I've got this to watch and this to watch, but shouldn't I have like eight more shows to watch? And the answer was just no. And then I started to think about, you know, not only is there a lack of depth in terms of shows, which honestly might be a good thing, but it was so interesting at some of the talent that wasn't used. You know, nobody flew in Titus Alexander. Nobody flew in Starboy Charlie. Uh, Josh Alexander, I think, was only used on the one show. There, there wasn't, uh, you know, some of the Chicago guys that I like being used. I, I it was just I, the indie pool is not very deep, and I was my big takeaway was like, oh, so and so weren't there. That's really odd, and that is just a stark contrast to where things were, you know, six or seven years ago. Yeah, it's something where I guess for like me, so I, I, I think this is something where. If we're going to talk big picture about this case, I kind of need to lay my biases here. Like, I'm someone that throughout basically every single era of WrestleMania weekend other than 2006, I was there in 2008 in Orlando, 2012 in Miami. Those are two different eras there. And then the most recent kind of boom that happened, like pretty much ending in 2019, I was there as well. It, it, it It's something where it kind of is a sense, at least if we – as consumers and as uh, analysts kind of take what was presented and and as much as we are able to discern from here it's not just that everything has been like so thin in a way it it, it becomes something where i don't know necessarily if you're not uh like tagged up with fight if you're not a part of iwtv and i still kind of wonder for iwtv how that all kind of works out for it I just don't really know like how much of it really is out there for you, you know, like, like, I just don't know how deep it can really get because now we're really seeing right now, especially this year, like the position of like Dragon Gate guys flying over here and doing this is at so much more of a benefit for the promoters than the independent stars right now, because you're, because of the status of the currency. 
And I imagine, I don't know, I, we don't talk about the travails of the dollar versus peso, but that's always kind of been a thing as well that I feel like is going to be happening more and more. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think you have to look any further uh, in just in terms of a, a change in scenery. And it's not like you and I are breaking any news here, but the WrestleCon Super Show this year, and no one knew who the Dragon Gate guys were. And outside of Mystico, I don't really think they knew who the CMLL guys were. And, and they're the ones that are hotter than Dragon Gate with, you know, with an English speaking audience right now. That is such a detachment from, you know, the, the years prior where you would have, you know, your New Japan guys come in and, right. and you would have, you know, some some triple A luchadors and, you know, maybe your your main event would be a nostalgia driven thing or whatever. But for the most part, you know, these were shows that were that were all star shows. And this year they leaned really heavy into nostalgia, you know, into Nick Nimeth and, you know, God, God bless him that that Joey Janela match was a very, very long 18 minutes. You know, they, they booked Oku and Teton. I, I thought that match was fine, but I didn't think either of those guys were over. Uh, Alexander versus Tanaka, I thought was very good, but I, I I felt like it was an upward battle to get the crowd into that. They eventually won it over. And then, you know, I, I don't think anybody in that audience knew Cavernario. I don't think anybody in that audience knew Casey. It was just, it was so shocking to see like, hey, those guys are trying hard. They're just not getting anything in that match. Yeah, and especially you have someone like, my big takeaway from the CMLL match was Star Jr. kind of left off the screen. You know, but no, no kidding. I was not yeah. expecting that. Yeah, and, and that was really the sort of thing with it that you have really the, the this case, and we talked about that, like, hey, Shun is going to kind of, he's there, it is weird, but it has to kind of be this way, and they'll assess it throughout the weekend. We had that kind of work out through there, but it is something where I think you look at a match like this, it almost goes half an hour, and by and large, it's just hard to kind of get that kind of reaction and get that kind of response here on a card where this was supposed to be the big breakout spot kind of thing. When really you have the, you have drama happening with, because Shun Skywalker and KZ are still feuding in Dragon Gate. As a Dragon Gate fan, I'm like, all right, we have continuity, baby case. <laughs> like, this, it makes perfect sense here. But it, it's something that for a show like this, because I remember going to the WrestleCon Super Shows in New Orleans, and it would, felt like it was like banger after banger after banger. And you have a position here where the Dragon Gate guys come in here. This is, for a lot of them, this is either their first match of the weekend or for Shun and KZ's case, their second match of the weekend. And they know that they still have five more matches over the next few days, and they just don't take it out a second. Yeah, I mean, you look at that New Orleans show, right? It's it's Pentagon versus Janela, uh, Tomohiro Ishii versus Jeff Cobb, Ray Phoenix and Ray Horace versus Bandito and Flamita, uh, Rocky Romero, Psychosis and Super Crazy versus Jason Cade, Matt Classic, and Teddy Hart. Uh, Will Ospreay, Adam Brooks, Sammy, uh, Adam Brooks, Sammy Guevara, and Shane Strickland in a four-way. Your main event, Golden Lovers versus Chuck Taylor and Flip Gordon. And your yikes, that didn't age well match of the week, Joey Ryan versus Jerry Lawler. But outside of the nonsense with Joey Ryan, that's a, that's an all-star show right there. And, and I, I just feel like if you put Phoenix and Horace versus Bandito and Flamita in front of the crowd in New York, or, or, I'm sorry, in Philly this year, which is crazy because it's Philly, I don't think they would have cared as much uh, as they did for Nick Nemeth. You know, I, I think yeah. the, it, any any super worker would have struggled in this environment. Real quick, because I, I, I want to go chronologically here. I want to start with Defy, which I don't have much to say on. So we'll pivot back to the super show. But let me ask you up top, because the big takeaway from people that are not hardcore Dragon Gate people, but that we're excited to see them in the States this week. And I, I think there's there's two schools of thought. There's one, which is just the ETU show as a whole, which we can talk about later. The other is that prior to that ETU show, the guys did not try very hard, that the effort was low. They were disappointed uh, by, you know, I don't know if it was the, the lack of a, a true classic or the lack of big bumps, or I don't know what it was, but I, I saw a number of complaints about the effort of the Dragon Gate guys. What do you think about that? I think that people have to 
I, I'm right now looking at Shun's uh, cage match. He had six matches in three days. That's something that for even a company that likes to tell that they do 180 days across a year, that's a lot of kind of miles put on. And I, 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 I do see where the thing is, oh, yeah, they're mailing it in a little bit. I think also a level of pacing kind of was that. And I think it's something with Shun Skywalker is being kind of like the nexus of the Dragon Gate uh, kind of roster out there. It is something that in the Dragon Gate sense of things, like they're going to kind of have to build their self space off that unless you have a full storyline kind of thing happening, right? Like he, he is the biggest heel in the company and he's with five baby faces. And yeah, which, which they played into, at least on commentary on the ETU show, which I thought was was great stuff. Right. Yeah. So do I think it's something where it's like a mailing end of a situation? I I, I can see that uh, response. I also can see that the matches where Dragon Gate, where it was Dragon Gate versus Dragon Gate or Dragon Gate versus other kind of established stars in a way were more likely that they were willing to kind of go at their pace, maybe. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't see the Thrashylvania match. I did not either. Well, yeah, no. with Skywalker Menor. I'm only now seeing that. I, I guess that was on IWTV, but I truly did not know where to watch it until just now. So I, I, I'll go back and watch that. But I heard it was short and really more of a house show style than anything. The only match that I thought they dogged it in was the Defy three-way and i'm not surprised by that because let's be honest you know those early morning shows whether it's been like a pancakes and pile drivers or you know sometimes they do effie's big gay brunch that early obviously it's a brunch show there's no match of the year contenders happening at 11 a.m it's just not happening so and I, it's I always been that case before covid like yeah yeah yeah. No, that's just, yeah that that's you know the tricky thing is you know especially like that pancakes and pile driver show because i think i reviewed one for voices of wrestling years ago I think the first one they did had kind of a loaded lineup. I think one of those shows they did a ladder match on and it's like, oh, hell, you know, it's it's Ricochet versus so-and-so. And then you realize it's Ricochet versus so-and-so. It's happening at 10 in the morning. It's just not going to be that good. That became the dance battle show for a few years. Yeah, and I remember that also, like, so Pancakes and Pile Drivers uh, and, and also Re- uh, Wrestling Revolver was so tied into WrestleCon. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, like, with how everything kind of changes, instead you get, like, positions like the five that have that 11 a.m. slot. I just think that it's something, like, Case, I know you do not consume substances. You don't drink. Uh, it's rough. Like, I'm almost 40. If I have two beers, like, the night before at another wrestling show, and especially with how Mania shows go, like, what do you really expect out of that? And it's something where you look at, what kind of how everything I feel like sets up for them for the weekend. That was not where Dragon Gate was going to make their bread and butter and where they had to make their bread and butter and stuff that I feel like they had the incentive to care, AKA ETU, AKA Janela spring break. I felt like that followed through. Yeah. There were some people that were down on the Dragon Gate versus Los Desperados match We'll talk about it more in depth in a minute, but I, I liked that match. I mean, it could it have been better? Sure, but I, I liked that match. And maybe that's the tipping point of the weekend is if you think they dogged it there and you don't think that match was any good, all right. You know, then then you're talking about a spring break match that was five minutes away from being a, an indie classic, uh, but didn't reach that level. And then the ETU show. So, so maybe that's just the line of the sand. And I happen to enjoy that match a little bit more than the average person. Whereas I think I enjoyed the WrestleCon match a little bit less than the consensus, but... I, at no point in the weekend, did I feel like there was an effort issue. I mean, if there was, it was on Defy, but I don't, like, I don't think anybody worked hard on that Defy show. I don't think Kenta uh, and Gringo Loco worked that hard on the Defy show. And and they were, you know, that match was fine. That's not a dig on them by any means. It was just the the tone of that show was kind of get in, get out, you know, dip your toe in the water for the weekend. But as a, as a Dragon Gate fan, yeah, I come away I come away pretty satisfied. Again, the, the WrestleCon reaction, I guess we can pivot back to that. The The lack of reaction they got there was a little alarming of just like, oh, wow, there's there's people out there that are doing WrestleMania weekend that just don't know these guys at all. That's crazy. I can't imagine a WrestleMania weekend 
even five years ago where, you know, if they put this match in like Laboom, I'm not saying the entire crowd would know everybody, but I, I would think they would be at least favorable. And or I did, be I, people in that crowd who would take the initiative to drive the yeah. response. And like, that, that I, did not happen there. I, it, I don't feel like that, like it happened at any of these performances for Dragon Gate. Like shows because I remember like like back in like 2008 like being like the one nerd trying or like 2013 in 2012 being the one person trying to chant mochi along with this thing trying to get everyone <laughs> else to do that that was just not that's just not the world we live in now no no it is not um it, it's it's crazy but it's not it, and so you know I guess we can talk about that match again you know Star Junior to me was the the real standout performer the thing that I liked on the Dragon Gate side is that the Mystico Skywalker interactions felt, even if the crowd wasn't giving them the juice that I thought they deserved, the Mystico Skywalker stuff, just by their sheer raw talent and charisma, you could kind of tell like, oh, this is special. This is this is very cool. This is happening right now. Right. It, it is something where you have two personalities and two people who have enough command of themselves and uh and, and at least one of them there who has super uh superstar mindset you know and i would say shun has that too but mystico definitely is a, 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 in the vein of ultimo in a way that like the two of them were just going to like be the the two egos and bow up against each other and it worked out there and that was for me, outside of Star Jr. and Casey, which I thought was really strong stuff there, that was the best part there. And, it, and it's something also where I don't know necessarily if it is something where it was incumbent on the uh, – that it was incumbent on the productions and on the promotions to kind of set things out there. But at this point, and really, uh, it, it, it's something where, like, I guess, like – my standards are too too high from a generation ago, but I just recoil when uh com oh, when companies put people like Kevin Gill there. Trying <laughs> well, I want to I want to talk about the commentators for each of these shows. Uh, your your thoughts on the duo of Kevin Gill and Veda Scott for this match? Oh, Kevin Gill is awful. Uh, is someone who I think has just been like an a, a, an open sore on the independent wrestling scene for far too long. And I thought that with circle six, we kind of did away with him and it was not fun to be reminded that he still exists. <laughs> um, I, Veda was, I mean, Veda always does her homework for Dragon Gate. Well, and that, and he, I thought she was all right. You know, Veda's done Dragon Gate matches in the past that I thought she did a better job on. My, my takeaway from these two as a pair was it's like they were in high school doing a book report on a book they hadn't read so they definitely read the back cover. They knew the characters they were supposed to know. But if at any point they were required to have added more substance to what they were talking about, they wouldn't have been able to do it. That was the big takeaway there was it was all – and look, I'm not saying everybody has to be Jay. I, I get it. That's not the standard I hold them to. But it all felt so surface level that I just could not help but laugh at it. Yeah, it is something where with how – independent wrestling is and how wrestlemania weekend is at the very least there are people that i know who went to wrestlemania weekend just to see the dragon gate guys and it is something where i don't know at least for me i tend to remember remember where i feel like i'm either being pandered to poorly or kind of talked down to and it really was like hey guys here is dragon gate and that's what's happening yeah no it, it was it was very much that I don't think they did anything inherently wrong, but I also didn't find them to be particularly good, which I would also say is, is a little bit of my thoughts on this match where, you know, I saw some people going four stars on it. And I'm, I'm, I'm not that nah. high. This was not a notebook match to me. The thing that it was missing, uh, you know, whereas spring break was getting to this point and then just ended. The thing that I'm, I'm very surprised by is that, this was like a like a psychology heavy match. It was it was uh, we talked last week about how important it would be with these Dragon Gate guys come over to keep things in canon. I almost think they they went too heavy into that of this match. This kind of should have been like a dumb spot match, and instead they told a bunch of different stories. And the thing that this was missing was quite honestly 
a big dumb dive train and some finisher trade-offs like other than like the mystico dive to the floor it's not like these guys went super crazy with everything and that's just what this match was missing it was it was weird to say but it was like too too subdued for my liking yeah it it, it is kind of the the thing where I guess you look at the five guys there and you would hope like, and in other matches across the weekend, they made sure to have like a big dragon kid high spot, uh, KZ mission impossible dive. And it was something here where even when like the moments were hit and the spots were done, it was not necessarily like, it was not just that it was like so far in Canada or like, so like subdued, it just felt like that it just, there were weren't really stakes this it, it was something where this match more so than any of the other performances of the weekend felt like the exhibition show other than shun and kz can't get along in said exhibition and then they break down yeah if there was one disappointment this weekend it would it would be this match i i was really hoping just given the the momentum that CM, cmll has and the fact that you know like we talked about last week historically there's just been very few interactions between cmll and drangate in their history I was hoping this would be uh, the match that people left this weekend talking about. And it, it, it did not, it did not hit that level for me. Again, it was just missing kind of a holy shit sequence that we never really got. And it, it, it seemed like, it seemed like we kept on inching towards that. And then the finishes happened. And I was like, Oh, well, I guess I, I guess I like star junior more than I did at the start of this match. So that's a good takeaway, but it was not what I hoped it would be. No, and, and for something that went 25 minutes, it was not where it could be like, it, it is something where like I have written down three and a half, but it is like such a disappointing three and a half that I'm like, yeah, nothing went bad and everything kind of went there. It's just kind of dissatisfying. I know it won't happen. It won't happen financially. It can't happen politically, but man, I wish Mystico would do like the the same schedule that Santo worked a few years ago where he did Kobe, he did Corkin, and then he did that Nagoya house show. Man, I wish they could get him in for that. That would be so cool to see he and Dragon Kid and Ultimo team together. Ah, God, I'd love that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so that uh, that took us to what was next? Uh, the uh, GCW, JCW. I'm gonna have to hand this to you because I did not catch this. That's one. That's right. Okay, so this was this was Los Desperados, Arez, Gringo, Loco, and Latigo versus Team Dragon Gate, Dragon Kid, Shun Skywalker, and Yamato. I like this match a lot. Uh, it, it's not a notebook match. I, I went three and a half on it, but it's it's the tale of two coins, right? Like, or, you know, the, the different side of two coins. Whereas the WrestleCon match was a disappointing three and a half. This to me was like a, oh, that was, that was a pretty fun three and a half stars. I thought the crowd was a little bit more into this. I thought Dragon Kid was far and away the star of this match. You know, Shun and Yamato were, were doing a little bit more shtick uh, than normal and Dragon Kid. And maybe it was just the excitement of somebody like Gringo Loco getting to wrestle him. But this was a lot of Dragon Kid and I thought I thought everybody did very very well here, uh, you know. So it ends up with uh, Gringo Loco pinning Yamato uh, with a very scary twisting moonsault. You should go back and watch the finish at the very least because uh, Yamato just about takes a ginormous knee to the face on that moonsault. But otherwise, I I enjoyed this for what it was. People seem to be down on this match, but to me, uh, you know, look not a, not a great match, but a very good one. One that I had a lot of fun watching. And when we were talking about this, what I hoped for this match was going to be like, all right. Gringo, here's Dragon Kid. Yeah. Go 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 to work. And and what you're telling me, like I have this show already bookmarked for me on my trailer uh plus uh provided by Fat Fight TV app that I was gonna make <laughs> sure to to check out for that. But all right, because I do kind of want to see uh how the base god does with Dragon Kid. I, I guess like the one thing that kind of surprises me here, but I guess it's Gringo's show, so he gets to say that is uh Yamato. Okay. I uh, did not see that coming for the finish. I look I Yamato Yamato is very giving on these US shows. I, I don't I don't know why that is, but Yamato is very giving. And I guess they weren't going to pin. I mean, Dragon Kid is arguably as protected and Shun took the loss in the CMLL match. So I don't think they were going right. to beat him twice. So it, it came down to Yamato. But look, this is essentially this is a prolonged Gringo Loco Dragon Kid match with Yamato and Shun uh, doing some stuff here and there. And then I really like Arez. I, I think he is a really cool wrestler. 
And the little bit that he did in this match, I also enjoyed. So for me, this was a fun three and a half stars. All right. I'm going to look forward to catching that one. And, and, then... and I also think that, and this is relevant before we talk about the spring break match. I thought the crowd was into this. The, the crowd seemed to want to like this match, which was for a nice change show. of pace. Yes. Which was a nice change of pace from the high spot show. Yeah. For this being a midnight show, but like hearing that this was a crowd that was up for it. That's uh that's real encouraging. Uh, the the kind of highlight match I would say for Dragon Gate outside of WrestleCon this weekend was uh, GCW attempting to revive the uh, the spirit of 2006 with Dragon Gate Classic consisting of Dragon Kid Yamato and KZ defeating the Reiwa New Generation Benkei Kota Minora and Shun Skywalker. It is a Bible elbow uh, smash combo from uh, Dragon Kid and KZ getting the win on Kota Minora. I thought that this rocked. Like, maybe it is that, like, I was okay with how it was closing theirs, and the fact of being a someone who keeps up with the modern-day Dragon Gate roster very intimately, Kid's been using the Bible as his main finish for this last year. So as soon as, like, I saw the Bible, I was counting along with it, and I was ready for the three count. Yeah, that's where... I, I don't want to say I wasn't ready for it because of the finish, but I wasn't ready for this match to end. I mean, I thought the match was great. I thought it was a great match, but it, it's weirdly authentic to current Dragon Gate because how many times do we come on here, especially after a big show, and go, hey, man, that match was awesome. Imagine what it would be like with three or four more minutes. And this is the One same more gear way. change. Yeah, One more th gear. this match yeah. wasn't ready to end when it ended, and that that is just such a bummer because I I was fascinated watching this show and maybe this is me looking for problems i don't know you know what we'll talk more about gcw as a whole in just a second but there were there were members of the crowd that were really into it and then there were some people in the front row that looked like they were watching this match they might as well have been in a guantanamo prison cell they they looked so miserable for most of this match and by the end of it it seemed like about 99% of the people were on board. And I just think like, man, they, they won over this GCW audience that is just an amalgamation of things that I don't personally like. But Dragon Gate has the talent to get over there. And they were on their way to what would have been outside of your most ardent, you know, uh, Cody Roman people that also had their peripherals on WrestleMania weekend for anybody that would have been invested in the weekend. This would have been the obvious match of the weekend. And then right before they got there, it just died. And it, it was such a bummer to see. Yeah, I, I, I guess it, it is something where it, it is that extra five minutes for it to happen. And it, it, it's something where, for me, at least, I like look at how this company like books things, and in, in, in a lot of ways, like uh, we should like say like uh, this was a match that they brought Lenny Lenny Leonard, who usually only does fight sport nowadays, came in on this. Jay, who flew in, who flew into the states, uh, was helping run in the uh, front and stepped in here and stepped in an ETU. So that was a really good nod towards us i would say or nod to the people like us i would say well yeah it, i mean look they, they tried to recreate 2006 because it was lenny and it was prezak and then they had jay now unfortunately jay is a soft talker and gcw is gcw so jay was drowned out uh for most of yeah. this match just by other noise but i appreciate what they tried to do because i you know lenny is lenny and I wish he did more, but I completely understand why he doesn't. And Prezak, for the most part, like I'm, I'm always going to at least, at the very least, give Dave Dave Prezak the benefit of the doubt. And I thought he did a pretty good job in this match. Right. Yeah. So, and it's something that I think that Prezak is someone who's kind of at the point where he he doesn't necessarily need to add more to his uh, announcing resume. So there's a lot of leash given. I feel like mm -hmm. and, I, I would concur. And it was something here where the leash was not needed with Prezak. It was something where uh, also in this match, uh, we got to see what Benke's favorite thing to do this weekend was. And <laughs> it was do his slide out cell for someone kneeing him in the face for the spear and uh, doing his corner shoulder tackle. Uh, 
I wonder for a lot of people who are really mad about like the uh, Final Gate uh, 2020 thing, like how they felt about like this, or did did they think about Final Gate when Ben K did this multiple times this weekend and got the biggest pop each time of the match? I I am sure those people didn't put it together, but you should really now that I think about it. Yeah, go go back and watch the GCW versus the World finish. And Gringo Loco really almost did to Yamato what Shun did to Ben. That is that is the <laughs> reference in my head I was trying to pull and I couldn't get there. They're an inch away from that same thing happening. Yikes, yikes. But but yeah, it, it is something there where in this match also and throughout the weekend, we kind of get to talk again about is this getting a little too far Dragon Gate Cannon? Kota Minora, his first uh his first uh, real excursion experience, like he has done a little bit in England, but by and large, never had the opportunity to do so. Taking almost all the losses and continuing the losing stretch happening from uh, from the end of Ray De Parejas' case, Dark, uh, I I I feel like we're getting closer and closer to say Dark Masquerade might be a thing. Well, it's either that or. And th- this could be a moot point by the time most people hear this, but I think there's going to be an addition to gold class that could give that unit some life. So I, my, my short term prospects on gold class are actually much more positive. Now that I've seen this cork and lineup, I will say this now, I was going to save this for the ETU show to me, the two big winners from this weekend are Ben K and coach Menorah. I thought they worked their asses off and menorah in particular and we weren't really sure what we were going to get from him i thought menorah busted his ass on this show and on the etu show and i was genuinely very impressed by him yeah it it was something where in this match i think like if we're going to talk about dragon gate six man kind of logic here Menorah was kind of the person that took the brunt of it because you had Shun Histrionics been doing his spots that got incredibly over at this thing. But the the backbone was kind of weirdly a KZ highlight match, I felt like at times with this. Yeah, I thought I thought it was funny. KZ has learned his lesson from wrestling in America before. He did not trust the ropes enough to do the mission impossible and instead just did a no-touch tope. Yeah, and landed right on his feet. <laughs> yeah, no, was, I know. This is like, oh, this guy's been to America before. He uh, He's now fully aware of uh, what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you test the ropes immediately before the match, don't do it. Don't do it. But yeah, did, did that match, did this match feel more like a KZ spotlight and that kind of thing? Because that was my big takeaway from it. I could see that, yes. You know, I, I was I was impressed by everybody. Again, I thought it was a great match, and KZ certainly had a lot of time. This was when Yamato, I thought, really put his working boots on. But my big takeaway, and not to say that the focus of this match was on him, but it was just how hard Minora in particular, and to some degree Ben, also worked on this. Let me throw something at you here, thought experiment. I would say for the Ring of Honor six mans, the most over move in any of those matches was the ultra hurricane Rana that dragon kid did. I feel like that probably got the biggest pop out of mm-hmm. anything. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Uh, it, whatever big Rana he would do. Usually it was the ultra Karana or the super hurricane Rana. Yeah. Yes. In this new era of dragon gate, the thing that I have seen get a better reaction than anything in America is Shun Skywalker doing the leap over from the bottom rope into the German suplex. That fires up every crowd he's done that in front of. Because like when he did West Coast Pro last year, he was wrestling Starboy Charlie, and the crowd wasn't into it for probably the first nine minutes of that 13-minute match. And then Shun did that German, and it changed the tone in the room completely. And that is the spot of this match where, again, you know, it was probably... At like 65, 35 people wanting to give this match a chance or caring about this match to to some degree. And the Shun German spot is what really took it over the top. And I think that's when people went like, oh, well, okay, all right, we're 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 doing something here. So credit to Shun. He seems to have that dialed in now. Yeah, it is something where I think like for me, what Shun Skywalker was able to accomplish more so just being himself and being command of himself. And understanding his character over the weekend was my big, like, going like, all right, 
I walked in this weekend thinking Ben K would be the one exploding off the screen. Shun still finds a way just from just self-awareness to being that guy at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's that's another interesting point, I guess, is some people were pretty taken aback by Shun's presentation. And, and look, there are people locked into Dragon Gate that aren't super into the way that Shun carries himself all the time. Personally, I, I'm I'm very into it outside of the Yamato Susumu match from a few weeks ago, which that one he annoyed me on. But Shun, I, you know, I think to his credit, worked this the way that he's worked all of his matches in Japan, and they were super character heavy. And I think if you followed the through line of Dragon Gate throughout the weekend, and let's just say, you know, you're a lapsed fan or or somebody that has, you know, maybe heard about the promotion but hasn't dipped your toe in yet, if you watched WrestleCon and you watched this match and you watch ETU, you would get by the end of the weekend, oh, Shun Skywalker's the top heel, he's deranged and he doesn't like anybody. Got it. All right, that's a character I understand now. Great stuff. Right, and it was something that I felt like... it. It, it, it's always kind of like a cool thing. And, and, and it's the fact that like Shun put enough thought into this weekend that he had what three or four different mask covers that he put in, you know, oh, like, you know, I mean, his mask budget, as we know, was just absolutely outrageous. Hey, it, it, it's something where I felt like in the masquerade days, he went what he was getting a little wild with tassels. Now he's wearing all black and I was like, OK, maybe he was subduing it. Nope, he's going to have a laser light one show in a pseudo dark masquerade mask. And then uh, it's something where, like, I just feel like he just he just jumps off like he just jumps off the screen in every kind of way. So moving our way through. Let let, let me let me pause real quick. Let me throw one more (laughs) thing at you. Spring break wise, because I went notebook on this. I went four and a quarter. I want I want to go much, much higher. But the match ended when it did in the Pantheon of the Dragon Gate WrestleMania six men. I I made this ranking on my Twitter with 2006 being at the top in its own category. And then category two was 2008, which was Muscle Outlaws and Typhoon. 2012, which I think is the forever underrated Dragon Gate six man. That's the one from Miami that you were at. And that was, that was low key. Low key and Mad Blanky versus Masaki Mochizuki. Uh, Dragon Kid and Pac. Oh, uh, Ricochet and Pac. That's right. It was it was yeah. low key Tozawa and Hulk versus Mochi, Pac, and Ricochet. Which is, again, that that is the one that's on YouTube right now. I I just I implore everybody to go watch that. So, 2006 is on an island. 2008, 2012, 2010, which was the first to Dragon Gate USA one from Phoenix, and then 2007 from Detroit. That is my category two, and then my category three would be 2024 at the top. And then 2013, 2011, and then 2014, which was the the Dragon Gate six man without Dragon Gate wrestlers uh, to to cap off Dragon Gate USA. I feel pretty comfortably this is not on the level of 2008 through 2000, uh, 2008, 2012, 2010, or 2007. But I also feel like in the pantheon of Dragon Gate six mans, we have seen worse matches than this one. Yeah, so I have your tweet pulled up right now, and I'm doing like my mental star ratings to what I gave for all of these right now. And it's just like, all right, so I think 06, 08, and 12 are all five star matches. So those kind of go off to their side. 2010 and 2007 are probably either four and a half to four and three quarters, I would say. And then 2024, I was four and a quarter on this one. I liked it more, much more than 20, 2000, 2014, which I don't count personally. 2013, I like less than you. And 2011, you, it, that, that was Ronan and, you know, Ronan just did not really always feel like a full Dragon Gate presentation. Yeah, you're you're really down on that 2011 one because that was Shima Doi and Ricochet versus uh, obviously Ronan, Taylor, Gargano, and Swan. And yeah, I remember I even at the time forced- you were... I don't know if I was even four stars on that one. Now I'm thinking about it. Yeah, you you were not into that one. And then 2013, which I had a tough time remembering because it wasn't the main event. Tozawa was, Shingo was the main event, but it was yeah, Gargano, it, Swan, and Ricochet versus Shima, Eita, and Tomahawk TT. Yeah, and that one was really like cram everyone else into a mat. Yeah, and I went back and actually listened to our review of that because I was trying to refresh my memory on what I thought of it. And that was that was a weekend where it was like, 
hey, how about Ata and Tomahawk TT? These guys are pretty awesome. And uh, then, uh, you know, life happened. <laughs> life finds a way. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's spring break. I mean, look, I was I was into that match. I thought the show as a whole, the, I watched the first three matches and you know, the presentation is not for me. I, I've said this before. I you know, I I have a very hard time just looking at MLJ. I find him to be such a grating, off putting presence. I think he looks like shit. I think he's bad at I I think he's bad at his job. I I, I am still again not not to be uh the hater that I was over the weekend. I'm still bothered by a lot of the presentation that I saw. Luckily, Lenny and Prazak and Jay were on the call, and I like that. It To me, it, it's just... It, GCW is the antithesis of so many things that is Dragon Gate, and that's not even inherently wrong or inherently bad, but there's a reason, I think, that within Ring of Honor at that point in time the Dragon Gate guys were able to to slip in really rather seamlessly and to make that promotion a second home. And, you know, in PWG in the, in the late 2000s when they were getting flown over all the time, it made sense they fit in that promotion. And no matter how good the Dragon Gate guys are, and no matter hot the GCW crowd might be, or no matter how big the GCW crowd might be, there are inherent uncontrollable differences that have been decided long before these two promotions ever work together oh absolutely that i i think it will just forever be a roadblock that neither side will be able to get past and and i'm just so curious to you know to know you know on the plane ride back you know if you're keto and rio saito chatting on the plane do you think it's do you think it's worth it do you think it's good to have your guys on gcw shows and you know all things considered i i've watched far more offensive content from GCW than I did this weekend. I thought they they were fine for what they are from the things that I saw, but it is it is just not Dragon Gate, and it's not who they are, and it's not who they're ever going to be, and neither promotion should change. I'm not making that argument. I mean, look, I would love to see GCW change a few things, but they're not going to. <laughs> it, it, it's just, I, I, I think they are just on two separate planes, and it will always be a very uncomfortable working relationship. Yeah, it's something where they kind of already have their perfect partner in DDT and Tokyo Joshi, you yeah. know? Like, there are a lot more natural similarities between GCW and DDT than there ever will be between Dragon Gate and uh, GCW. Like, it's I, just... Yeah. I, I, I think it's just stating facts there. And it's something where I think that I, I, I go back to the discussions we've had with Jay over the years about like you kind of just have to do it. Like it is the kind of the game in town. And it's and it's such a shame in a lot of ways, like not to completely move to ETU. It's a shame that like ETU is in their kind of position right now. They're still a very young promotion. They're still very much like growing in at this place where there definitely is like a attempt at homage and an attempt at trying to create those through lines there. But it, but the differences in exposures between your GCWs and your ETUs and WrestleMania weekend is just not at that place, you know? So do you go and do the six man tag on the biggest show of the weekend and do your 10 man tag on the other big show of the weekend. And then are you satisfied then with your, a lot more boutique performance that you have at VTU? I wonder if, if that uh, calculus makes sense. I think but, it does. I mean, look, I, you know, credit to each you cause we, we can transition there. I mean, my knowledge of the promotion going into the weekend was that they had booked Kento and Estrella when they first went over to North America. It was their first booking in the United States. And I thought they treated them with respect. And I thought they made the match look like a big deal. And I was I was very into that. But it was it was fleeting and they were a promotion that I, you know, I, I knew the name of at that point and I was able to name check, but it, it wasn't something I was watching going forward. I, I, I will say this about ETU up top. They've got me for their next show. I am I was so impressed by some of the things this promotion did. And look, this is not a show of the year candidate, although there were numerous great matches on it. They didn't reinvent indie wrestling. They just put forth what I thought, it's an odd word to use, I thought they put forth a classy independent wrestling show. 
and it was a really nice change of pace by the end of this weekend. It is something where that we've been around the block long enough that if this is the kind of show that a local promotion puts on WrestleMania weekend, we don't, it's something to be celebrated, frankly. I feel like because there's so many like piggybacks and there's so many people that go like, all right, WrestleMania is coming into our area. So we're going to run all these shows and we're going to go do X, Y, and Z. And we're going to try to capitalize on it. But what does that happen every time case? Oh, they're just, they're awful. They're awful. You know, there's, they... there's so many bad, that's like, that's the crazy thing, right? And this is why, mm-hmm. and I, I will always defend Rich and Joe uh, when they, they took so much heat for this a few years ago when like AIW started running WrestleMania weekend and people got upset because they called them out. But it's like, Mania weekend for a long time wasn't, it wasn't a, a quantity thing. It was a quality thing. And that pivoted and it became, Let's run as many shows as possible. And a lot of those shows sucked. And I, I think it did damage to the prestige of this weekend for indie wrestling. And in this ETU show, I mean, the simple way to describe it is it was what the action wrestling Dean show was, but for Dragon Gate fans, like the Dean stuff is being applauded almost universally. And I'm, I'm thrilled for them. And it, it was a beautiful idea and tribute and credit to them for putting it together. There was stuff on that Dean show that is inherently not for me. ETU, uh, much like Action Wrestling, had a vision. They executed it, and this show just happened to be extremely for me. Yeah, it, and, and it's something where I felt like watching this show, and I think it's also with the kind of promotion ETU was, that the the, the one match that everyone was like, that's going to be a weird match, uh, ended up being like at least the best possible example of that match you know and everything else there on this show everyone was working everyone like the dragon gate guys there's no i don't think you could say that that dragon gate uh dogged it on wrestlemania weekend if you watch the etu show i think that i think most people would agree that you know maybe they didn't like the defy stuff maybe they they didn't think the spring break match was as good as we thought it was but i think universally i mean i haven't seen a single person that hasn't been overly complimentative of the DTU or the ETU show. Sorry. I mean, Dylan Hales, who doesn't like Dragon Gate, and Dylan and I have spent a decade talking about how he doesn't like Dragon Gate, but he's he's a part of independent wrestling TV and he was raving about this show. And that's when you know it was a good show. Yeah. And it's something where you cannot say that Dragon Gate dogged this weekend if you've seen this show. And if you are saying that without seeing uh, ETU unlock the unexpected, then you need to pull up IWTV and watch it. It is two and a half hours and it is an utter blast. I guess we should probably, should we just take this match by match? I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they opened up. This was uh, Jack Solomon from ETU. Jay, uh, I think, was only supposed to do the first few matches, but ended up just hanging out the entire show on commentary. But we opened up with a four corner survival match. Ho Ho Loon versus La Estrella, both of them representing Dragon Gate, versus Brayden Toon and Yoya representing ETU. Ho Ho got the win with the Ho Ho roll on La Estrella. Kind of very, uh, when I saw this match being made and I thought it would be a kind of a four way match, kind of what I expected it would be, both from a quality standpoint and result wise. But I came away with this Ho Ho got to have like a kind of a spotlight performance and given what all ho ho loon does for dragon gate and does for weekends like this i was incredibly happy for that i mean ho ho anoki over here booker man putting himself over you know coordinating everything for the weekend he's like well you know it's, i mean what, what am i gonna do not not take the pinfall here brother i mean come on now i i i very much enjoyed the finish of this match <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I will be doing my I'll be doing my move and I'll be doing it to the guy who only comes back to Japan to get his visa renewed. And, and I, I will say this, you know, that while this four way wasn't exactly anything special, uh, one, I like Yoya. I I want to see more of him. I want to see him in different environments. Uh, you know, there was a guy basically my aspirations for him coming out of the show. There's a, a Chicago indie wrestler named Paco for a number of years. Yep. Yep. And yeah, I, Paco was maybe 5'4". He was maybe 140 pounds. He never broke out anywhere. I always heard he had a great shoot job, and so he was perfectly satisfied just doing Chicago Indies. I, I don't know what he did, but I, I, I heard 
he was okay with the schedule he was working, at least when I asked somebody about it. But Paco became crazy over an AAW because he could wrestle Jake something and he could wrestle Josh Alexander. And he once wrestled Ace Romero in a match that was so crazy over in the Logan Square Auditorium. One of my best memories of watching wrestling live is AC Baby versus Paco. And it was just, you know, he's a small guy who had a few different rhythms that he could play. And it was just nice to see. And Yoya, just because of his size and build, reminds me of that. And I'm kind of curious to see what he can do. I, I don't believe I had ever seen him wrestle before. And I liked him a lot in this match. Yeah, I've seen Yoya a couple of times. I know he was originally at one point based in the Midwest. And I felt like during early COVID, like when everything was happening in Indianapolis. That's okay. All right. I have seen I, him. That's right. Yeah. And I feel like from then to now, he I I enjoyed him in this. It he is it is something where I had Braden Toon also was big man doing interesting things. I have time for that. Needs refinement, but I felt I didn't feel like it was a I didn't, I didn't think he was bad. I felt like he just was was just kind of at this point of the card. I'm not expecting someone to g- completely have the most crisp uh, moves there, especially for someone of his size. Well, no one on this show. This is the nice thing. No one looked out of their depth. You know, if anything, no, not at all. If anything, somebody like you know Mike Santana was like, oh, I didn't I didn't know we had that in him, but. It was nice to see because I feel like in the past, you know, like I I don't want to be mean, but like Yamato versus Tony Deppen. I thought Tony Deppen was exposed. He was not on the level of Yamato. Uh, Yamato versus Blake Christian from GCW two years ago. I kind of thought Christian got exposed. And, and, and this was a case where, you know, the guys, the, the homegrown ETU guys, I, I look, l- let me put it this way. I didn't feel the need to buy any of them a plane ticket to go to Japan immediately. But I also, you know, with, with Alec Price and, you know, especially with Marcus Mathers, just because he's so young, it was like, all right, there's something here. And none of these guys look like a fish out of water. They all worked to their potential. And, you know, I think it's worth talking about now as we kind of get into Brandon Kirk versus KZ. It, it, despite whatever you might think about the effort of the Dragon Gate guys throughout the weekend, it was very clear they were all locked and loaded on this show, and I've shared this on on this podcast before, but, you know, I, I heard from somebody who I, I very much trust, who is not really, uh, not linked to Dragon Gate and is not linked to, to GCW, but is somebody, you know, that, that works in the, the American indie scene, that, you know, when, when Dragon Gate guys first went over to GCW, they were unimpressed, I, I think is the word that was used. They were unimpressed with the locker room, and the presentation and just the entire thing, you know, it, it wasn't the ring of honor locker room of old. It wasn't their locker room in drag at USA. There were just a few things that caused the drag guys to raise their eyebrows. And I personally don't know. And I, I don't want to speculate if they are just unimpressed with GCW, but they know that's the top indie right now. But I do know that they had their game faces on, on this ETU show and it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure out, you know what? These ETU guys treated Dragon Gate with a ton of respect. The matchups, just not knowing the ETU guys, but knowing the Dragon Gate guys and then seeing the results of this show, it seems like they lined everybody up perfectly for what could be the start of a fruitful relationship. I hope it is. I, this was just, it, it was just respectful and it was nice. And I, 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 before we talk about the next match, Jack Solomon and, and Jay together, uh, what a job by Jack Solomon. I, this guy taught me so much about his promotion. He did a great job. He didn't swear at me. He didn't tell me to suck his dick. It was just so pleasant. It was. It's why I like AAW, and it's why I like West Coast Pro, and I hope within the indie scene that ETU can get some good buzz out of this, that whatever West Coast Pro is going to do with Deadlock and with Prestige, that maybe that leads to some interest. This, to me, is indie wrestling. This is the show I was hoping for all weekend. This is the show that I got. If I have one complaint before we rave about the rest of the show, personal problem for me, this is my own issue. I would like the ring announcer to dress a little nicer. I don't want him to wear a hat, but that's my thing. That's my tick. That's my problem. But man, I just, I I have to get that out of the way just now before we talk about the rest of these matches. 
I just appreciate what this show was. And, and I, yeah. I get the feeling you do the same way. Yeah, and it was something where talking about Jack and Jay, I felt like we kind of got to see a part of Jay that at least I would say if like the two of us that we don't get to see very often, which is Jay being a great educator yeah, in a way. And it was something where Jack representing ETU put his best foot forward. I It is something with the greater state of wrestling commentary. There's a lot more bad commentary than good commentary. So we feel the need to really trumpet the good commentary. And I think Jack, has it in him for that but the, the the fun for me was that you had these two sides coming together and you have someone like jay who is very unique in his abilities and his perspective and really just in the fact that i mean he is the one person that i mean to this day i mean i'm willing to defer to i know you do as well and he the the thing that time and time again over the years that i feel like that jay does best as a as kind of an analyst best as an historian is teaching and i felt like that happened in this kz and brandon kirk match we get like little nuggets about like a betsu and about like how much of a podunk little town it is and how that kind of worked in that way and it was something that i felt like provided an element that you don't necessarily get to see from dragon gate network shows and i thought that was really cool no you're exactly right i mean Jay Jay is like sneaky funny and I don't know if he gets the credit for that but like Jay personally his sense of humor and how dry he is is very amusing to me so Jay was making me laugh very hard during parts of this show the other thing is that you know it's funny because Jay is like a reluctant commentator I don't know if he enjoys doing commentary I, I know he certainly didn't want to when he started doing it I think he's become a genuinely excellent commentator but you're right we got to see him in a different role he wasn't doing play-by-play here this was more like and i still think this was the the dream team and it's a shame we only got one show with them or maybe two shows but when it was lenny leonard and larry dallas and jay in japan and jay was that third chair mike Tanay role that is one of my favorite teams i have heard in all of wrestling because it was jay in the pocket just giving us little factoids, letting Lenny do the call, letting Larry be the character. That was a perfect team. And, and this combination of, of Jack and Jay wasn't quite that, but it was Jay a little bit more in that role. I think he's a great play-by-play guy, but this is really his calling is, is what he was doing on this show. Yeah, and it was something that, like, as someone who, in this next match, KZ versus Brandon Kirk for the... That for it was a key match to see who was the number one contendership to the key to the east and this was like a part of it that i really enjoyed was the fact that etu wears its dragon system influences on its sleeve and you get to have jay and jack talking about well in japan when you get the key you kind of don't have to defend it you're good until your title match and it's like oh brandon has to defend that you had Brandon Kirk successfully defend his uh, contendership to the key to these title against KZ with a psycho driver. And as someone who's mainly used to Brandon Kirk as like an ICW no holds barred guy or a deathmatch guy, just him doing like the stiffness and with someone like KZ who is always willing to kind of do like that. And in a match that was not very long, this match went nine minutes. I thought that this was just a fun hard-hitting sprint and i was almost notebook on it i really enjoyed it brandon kerr for those that haven't seen him looks a lot like tim donst and that was kind of yes yes yeah i would say looks like him wrestles like him where you know it's he 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 tried really hard and i i don't know if every single brandon kirk match i would be super into but i you know he played off casey perfectly well and this ended up being a really good match by the end of it i was at three and a half and I was Again, three and just, three quarters. Just, yeah, yeah, just just a, a one of those where it's just deeply satisfying. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and then we led into what I felt like outside the main event was one of the matches of the night: Shun Skywalker versus Alec Price. Shun wins with the moon salt knees after he uh, anti aircraft drop kicks Alec Price out of anywhere. This is the second time Alec Price has faced a Dragon System guy. He faced a. Uh, sp kento back in 2022 and feel the same way i feel i felt back then this is a guy that if it ever really lined up and i don't know if it would line up i think that if he was willing to go and 
put on the green uh, Zack Ryder tights that uh, it would do. A, he would work and it would work out for him the long term. I just don't think it would have. It's going to happen in today's day and age. But I love this. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm with you. You know, I enjoyed that Kento match when it happened and I, I went four stars on this. I mean, price was. Price was so incredibly impressive because I liked him on this show and I liked him on the GCW versus the world show. And I didn't even think the match he was in on that show was particularly good, but I thought he looked pretty good in it. But here against Skywalker, I mean, this, this, this was fantastic. I mean, even the little, the little blemish in this match, which oddly enough was the, the bottom rope German suplex that Skywalker does, you know, Skywalker went over, and expected Price to be a little bit closer to him. He mi- he missed the grab, but then Price was able to seamlessly kind of roll into that German suplex. And even that was like, that was really impressive because I know they weren't trying to do that, or at least it very much came across like they weren't trying to do that, but that they covered up an error in a really clever way. And that's the sort of stuff that I really like seeing. I, I thought Price laid in all of his offense. It looked like big league hard hitting offense. And Skywalker seemed in his element here because Price was somebody that, you know, doesn't have a ton of muscle. Skywalker could bully him and throw throw him around a little bit and still do his character work. But when it came time to turn it up, they they were on the same level. I I loved this match. Yeah, it's something where I feel like Alec Price is someone who is in the unique position that if you were to ask me, okay, so okay, who are your five uh, breakout independent stars of the 2020s? I feel like he would be kind of if you're letting me count to ten, he would make that ten. Because he's someone that, at least from the way I kind of look at it, he he has come on strong at least during like COVID era and then coming out of COVID era of his IWTV run. But it's something where I think he is such like a unique presence that it is like when we say like the plane ticket to Kobe. I don't know if the fan base knows what to do with a someone who kind of has both his look and his personality or at least the person he portrays in the ring, but it is something I'm, I'm compelled to see in a way. And I, and, it, and it's something where like, he's still, I think 23, if that. So really, okay. I didn't know he was that young. That's I, crazy. I, I, I thought he was, Oh, he's 25. So still That's, 25. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's my age. I mean, he's a baby uh, mm. and, oh. and wrestles, wrestles like a grown man, you know? Uh, so yeah, no, that would look, I was, I was super impressed by him. I had the same takeaway though. I had the same note of like dragon gate has never really had anybody that looks like him before uh, you know he he just has a different aesthetic than uh ricochet or uha nation let's say chima and, would would outright just take his money from a seminar and tell him like uh okay uh uh your, your ticket for the show is 20 dollars. yes yeah yeah that's that's exactly it and, but i i think he has a ton of talent and you know absolutely the, the big thing with him and and alan forel make this great point in the voice of wrestling discord is like look this is a guy who, with his body type and the way that he wrestles, he would probably be greatly aided by a Japanese diet and Japanese conditioning. And it would just be, I think he could really blossom if dominoes fell a certain way for him. So, you know, coming out of this weekend, if I was going to advocate, you know, for one person to come over to Dragon Gate from this ETU show, it's got to be Alec Price. I, he really, really impressed me. And that's what I'm going to be looking for going forward on the CTU show is, you know, what is an Alec Price doing? You know, let me get in tune with Marcus Mathers because he was a guy that I was unfamiliar with. Let me check out more of this Miracle Generation. Uh, But Price, to me, was the big winner of this show and the big winner of the weekend. Absolutely. Talking about the Miracle Generation, they made what I I, I'm going to try to pull up the exact number because it's ridiculous for people who did not watch the show. They made their uh 35th title defense of their IWTV world oh, sorry 34th title defense of their IWTV uh independent wrestling tag team championship match in a Dragon Gate rules match they made this uh very open and clear that they were going to have the tag match done with the the typical 20 count on the floor uh you slide under the rings count as a tag uh, not necessarily the ref rules, but you know that's not a real big thing here. But Miracle Generation uh, make their 34th defense of their IWTV uh, tag team titles with the device on Kota Minora here 
and we got to have probably what I thought was the even more brutal Ben K spear bump happening on this show. Yeah, look, uh, first of all, I, I think the commentary on this show peaked in this match because Jay was so genuinely curious by the fact that they had made at that point, you know, what, 33 successful title defenses. And then they had this great back and forth on the rules and what makes these promotions different. And it, I got, it was just, it, it was so, it was so refreshing because it was like one of those deals where you could just tell they, they were both really invested in the work that they do and the work that Jack does with ETU. And obviously the work does uh, the, the work that Jay does, at the dragon gate that all came to fruition in this match. So the presentation of it was on another level. The thing that I enjoyed so much about this was that, you know, quite frankly, I, I don't think Miracle Generation were on the level of Ben and Benora. You know, you know, I, I thought they were good. They, they very clearly are guys that need to work with wrestlers that are better than them, and they, they got the chance to do that. But this goes back to my point about why Menorah and Ben are my MVPs of the weekend, because when I think about the, the history of Coach Menorah matches, he's not a guy that often leads. You know, he is often being led to greatness. Mike, I thought Coach Menorah led these guys to a great fucking match. Yeah, it was something where with the matches being bulk around him, it, it it's really shown us how just complete of a wrestler he is at this point. And at this point of his career, uh, getting to know that him and uh, Ben were in the same wrestling competitions, but Ben was an adult and he was a high schooler was kind of wild. Yeah, I don't think I knew that. Yeah, but it, it is something where like you look at Kota Minora and where he's at in his career right now. I mean, 25 years old and he is something where like we're now kind of getting to see his quirks and his changes right now. And at this time with gold class being where it is and him being elevated at this point, I really think that this is something where do I think like miracle generation like like is that kind of the tag match I wanted to see for like a Dragon Gate tag match happening this weekend? I don't think so, but is it something where I kind of come away from this match and at the very least do I think like team muscle even though what all happened at Raid A Prey all's happened? I think they are probably one of the top 3 pairings in the company right now and this match is a good piece of that evidence in their favor. No, it was it, it was awesome. I mean, I, again, I can't think of another time that Menorah specifically has elevated a match the way that he did. And, you know, Ben had an interesting weekend on the shows that he did appear on because I thought he was great in the six man. I thought I mean, I thought Ben was awesome in this match. I feel pretty strongly, though, that Ben wasn't weird enough. You know, Ben yeah, in Japan, very dude. Yeah, Ben in Japan has been a weirdo. I mean, that's the it's the best analysis I can give is he is just doing weird stuff. He tweeted stop like nonsense. Yeah, and I just I I don't want to say they missed an opportunity with it, but I was kind of hoping in the same way that you know Shun really just transferred over what he had been doing in Japan. I was hoping we would get that with Ben, especially like you know it, it almost goes to your point about Game Changer and DDT. Like, Ben should have been weirder for the Game Changer crowd, especially. And he he kind of reverted back into stoic Japanese warrior, you know, less chicky chicky things for whatever reason. You're, yes, I'm glad you picked up on that as well. And here, you know, again, the the in ring was phenomenal. He kicked ass in this match, but it it wasn't the Ben that we've come to know. It wasn't chicky chicky gold class Ben K, and that to me was a little bit of a bummer. Yeah, and if and I think the one thing that like stops me from kind of putting Ben on the pedestal that you are for this weekend, like I think Shun was kind of that, but is the fact that if he came out with like the uh, the the three fake uh, Cuban link chains and the and the banana and all of that, and it's just automatic like starting to this and it's just like interacting with the crowd, I think that it kind of adds that flavor that needed to happen. That was the thing I was really hoping for him. And that was the thing that like, whenever we talk about who should be the most over guy, it has been doing those things because it's one of those things that I feel like we all like look at, at how independent wrestling is, especially with like GCW, like that I am that there's a part of me that's very surprised or a little bit like underwhelmed and surprised the fact that you did not get like chicky, chicky uh, sensei Ben in the clusterfuck. 
Rio Saito, I'm surprised he didn't bring his tights over to show up in the clusterfuck. Like, that was a weird takeaway for me. It was like, none, no Dragon Gate in that whatsoever. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. I guess I'm, I'm glad Maybe they that... were already on the way back and they, they were in bed and they're like, no, I don't want to go out there for that. We don't like going to GCW. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm on a personal level, I'm thrilled they weren't in the clusterfuck, but it, it does feel like a missed opportunity on Game Changers' behalf, absolutely. Right, but and especially for someone like Ben. Like, that is what you would kind of want to see from him in that spot. Uh, what did you have for this one? I think I liked it a little bit more than you did. I went three and three quarters, and I, I could be talked into four stars live on the air here. Okay, I was at three and three quarters, but I, you were sounding like I that you were going to come in at like three and a half, three and no, a quarter. It was just, you know, the, I thought the match started really slow. And, and credit to Waller and King because they got better the longer the match went. But that, you know, kind of five minutes in, you know, it's a, it's an eleven minute match, and kind of five minutes in, I'm like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know what we're going to get here. And then all of a sudden, it just clicked, and it, it seemed like in the match, Waller and King got their confidence, but also Ben and Menorah just took it up a level. And, and we just don't see Menorah take things up a level like that. So. I just thought for what it was, I was like, man, this is, to me, this is the home run of the weekend, divorced of Drangate standing in America, but for the sake of Drangate and for the sake of Menorah, like, what an encouraging match to watch. Yeah, no, that, I, I see your point there. I ended up at three and three quarters as well, but, like, yeah, it was something where, like, Waller and King, like, the confidence they started to build on that, like, not that I would send them the tickets. I'm like, oh, as a tag team, like I think about and I remember how the Bucks talked about how going to Japan the first time in Dragon Gate was the time that they started thinking about themselves as a tag team. And they're like treating it like in that kind of way and taking it kind of professional and serious, you know, and I wonder if that was like a thing. And a lot of that ended up being confidence as well to be able to do that because uh, performance and repetition breeds confidence and I wonder if that's something also like if Miracle Generation somehow got to have like an ETU, like a five match like series, like bringing in tag teams for them to face. I I wonder if that would do like a huge bit of good for them. But I mean, it is something where like 34 tag team title defenses, like I, I guess that that it's not necessarily a reps thing for that. No, I just think they need to wrestle guys that are better than them. And I That's don't, fair. you know, I, I don't know as I, as I briefly scroll through their, their title reign here, because admittedly, I'm not too up to date on what they're doing. You Perfect know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking through these names and I, I just, I, it, it's names that I know and it's, it, it's names that I don't even think these guys are bad necessarily, but I, I don't think, you know, they're being tested in, in any sort of big way. The problem is that, you know, the, the indie scene as a whole is very depleted right now, let alone the tag team scene. There's not a DDT4 coming anytime soon, you know, like an all-star tag team tournament. And that's yeah. what they're missing. So, yeah, I mean, look, if I if, if, if I had any say in what they were doing going forward, you know, I tried to get them an astronauts match. And I I tried to get them out, uh, I, you know, to uh, I, who's the there's a, the tag team on the West Coast, I think I like. But, you know, again, like I'm struggling to think of tag teams they should wrestle. That's just the goal for them going forward is, you know, whether it's international or some domestic teams, if they can up the ante, I just, I think they just need to work with better wrestlers. Cause I think those guys are good. And I kind of think they, they played themselves into shape here almost. And uh, at, at first looked a little out of their depth. And then by the end of it, they were on their level. So it was nice to see uh, from, from their perspective as well. So looking at their 34 IWTV tag team title matches, uh, there's only two tag teams that they have defended the belts against that I would say are bigger stars than uh, or three tag teams that are bigger than uh, Team Muscle. So you have MXM that they that was their last defense case. The Batiri, uh, uh, Dark Order, uh, actually Super Smash Brothers, and then also uh, Grizzled Young Vets. They face Grizzled Young Vets. I have not thought about Grizzled Young Vets in, in quite a while. Uh, you know, it's funny, like Super Smash Brothers was one of those teams where I was like, oh, well, they should they should probably wrestle them. And, and they have, and they've wrestled Garini and, and Kevin Koo, Violence is Forever, and right, I'm a big yeah. Kevin Koo guy, so it's like, all right, you know, they're, it, it looks like when I just look at their Deadlock match listing, like Deadlock is doing the things that I would recommend they do. That's nice to see. You know, it's just... There's just not a lot of those teams out there. West Coast Wrecking Crew is the other team I was trying to think of, uh, and and they wrestled them in West Coast Pro. So, again, they're on the right track. I just wish there were more teams out there for them to really experiment against. 
Absolutely so. And then we had our third pseudo title match of the night. This is the ETU key to the East title. Marcus Matters retains against Dragon Kid with a 450 splash. First time for me to see Mathers in a singles match in this context, especially as a champion here. I walked away pretty impressed with the guy. I do feel like this match also very much was Dragon Kid being one of the most giving wrestlers ever. Just unbelievable. I mean, I, uh, Joe Lanza said this in the Patreon audio he did, but he's right. You know, Dragon Kid could have walked into this building and been like, you know, I'm I'm fucking Dragon Kid. You know, I don't have to put Marcus Mathers over. And instead, Kid spent 16 minutes establishing this guy as, you know, just a, a, you know, almost like a god to these fans. Just a 21 year old who got so much offense in on Dragon Kid. And I didn't particularly think Mathers was great. I thought this match was you know, a step below Skywalker price and a step below the, the gold class match. But Mathers is so young. I I'm only very encouraging or very encouraged rather about his future and excited to see what he becomes. Oh yeah. The the thing I will, I will say this divorced from any in-ring analysis. The thing I like most about Mathers and this, this shows just how odd indie wrestling has gotten, but Mathers has such professional looking gear that I'm like, all right, I'm going to root for this kid. He looks good. He clearly cares. He clearly took this Dragon Kid match seriously. I'm now a fan of him going forward. Yeah, it that is something I did not really think about. But it, it, even doing something where, like, so he had on, like, the 1980s uh, uh, powder blue and maroon Phillies colors with, like, that. And it was something where, like, we, we've seen a lot of wrestlers throughout the time, like, pick the local sports teams as, like, their color reference and, like, and all of that. But it was something where, like, there was a sheen of, like, okay, there was some thought there. Maybe, like, whoever he got to make his gear was someone that he was able to, like, put some thought and some heart into that. Like, he, it, it is something where, at least for, like, someone of his age, he came off like that, ch- like, the young champion. And it really felt like, okay, had this Wiley veteran come in here. I think I was a little bit higher. I was four on this. I thought that the gear change into the finish was one of the stronger things on this show. But the gear change, what it really made me think is, God, Dragon Kid is an amazing pro wrestler more so than anything else. Yeah, no, you're. I mean, this Dragon Kid, you know, what a weekend for him. Not that he needed it. He didn't need to prove himself to anybody, but what a weekend for him. I, I'm lower on it than you, but I, I'm encouraged by what I saw from Mathers, and I'm excited to see what he does next. Absolutely. And then we got the match for us sickos. Ultimo Dragon versus the cold-hearted play of Danny DeManto. Uh, less than, uh, I think timeline-wise, less than 24 hours after Danny DeManto had a hellacious death match uh this match went eight minutes ultimo decided he was done in one of the law magistral after a lucha brawl it was painless and it very clearly meant a lot to demanto so more power to him yeah like i i i it's hard to like be angry about like doing a vanity thing when it is something that was we got separados on a on a dragon gate affiliated theme which is hey good for that there Ultimo, when he gets the brawl, is a lot of fun. Uh, I did like the fact that Jack and Jay were like making making jokes about uh, what people think Ultimo is and what he really is in 2024. I really enjoyed that in that here. And there was the moment where you could tell that Demanto kind of was like, tap, I'm done. And Ultimo did the log mod draw and we got out of there. Yeah, no, I was, it was very much fine for what it was. I, it was fine to very funny, which is what, <laughs> which is all that I was hoping for with Ult. Like, if you're going to an Ultimo Dragon match in 2024 and you're not hoping for it to be a work show or for it to be just ironically funny, I don't know what you're wanting. Like, this is do not be a dark pure flosion. Like, be a be, be honest about it. Well, it's again, I said this last week, but it's nice that you know I don't know if Ultimo didn't want to take a lot of bookings or what the story was but it's it, it's very nice for Drangi to be in america at the same time as ultimo and for it not to be uh, the ultimo show you know that to me is a very encouraging sign absolutely absolutely and then we got the main event mike santana versus yamato after a real war 18 minutes 39 seconds uh, santana puts him away with the argentine rack powerbomb and 
I thanks thanks to Santana. I was really happy that someone pointed out what he said in the post match uh, uh, about Dragon Gate and WrestleMania week and in the mid two. Well, it makes total sense. You know, Santana ran it and raved, you know, in a in a really enjoyable way after the match about, you know, how Dragon Gate ruled the scene and influenced a lot of guys and really changed the scene. And it makes sense because this match, it could have headlined a peak Ring of Honor show. It could have headlined any Dragon Gate USA show. It would have fit right in, you know, not, not only just the quality of it, but the vibe, the intensity, the feeling. You could tell this match meant a lot to Santana. You could tell that Yamato was putting a lot of effort into it. You know, this is probably, I guess I like the six man from spring break a little bit more, but outside of that, this is the best match I saw all weekend. Oh, I was four and a half stars on this. It is something where this, like, you could tell that Santana was a Dragon Gate USA fan, especially a 2009, 2010 Yamato fan with the way that they worked this match. It had a little bit of, the best parts of a Yamato Dragon Gate uh, Dream Gate build for me, I feel like, because Yamato is someone that, I mean, case we've talked about him off and on for years now. His Dream Gate stuff does not always equate with me or his big match stuff here, but this felt like every bit of what a DGUSA main event would be. It was something where you could, in a way, almost see this as, I don't know who the lineal open the freedom gate champion is right now i'm afraid it's going to be like scripts or someone at this point but this felt very much so that if someone could have gone and stolen the belt from gabe i would have been okay with santana taking the belt off of that you know i i completely agree i think that's a really good way to put it you know uh, drang it usa ended with no Drangate guys. And when you think about it, this almost feels th- th- this feels like the spiritual successor to the end of Drangate USA. This feels like they put a bow on Mania weekend finally. And if it's the last time they ever come over, you know, I'm more than happy to think about this match instead of the colony versus the bravado brothers versus AR Fox and Ricochet and Rich Swan. You know, th- this is, this was just really enjoyable. And again, it was just nice to have that vibe back. And this is something you know, that a lot of, I guess, lapsed indie fans talk about is it's not even always the talent or the commentators or, you know, what the other things we nitpick. It's just the vibe is gone. The the jock vibe of indie wrestling has gone away. And, I you know, I know for a lot of people that, that that's fine with them and, whether it's death matches or comedy or both, they they find enjoyment in it. But I, th- it's not for me. And we've talked on the show for nearly five years now about how it's not for us. And this Santana versus Yamato match uh, felt like a retro classic in a way that was just really, really enjoyable. So on top of the in-ring work, which I thought this was the night of Santana's life, you know, credit to him for being as great as he was here. It was just a, a, a vibe in the room that I think everybody realized this was something pretty cool. And I think everybody in the crowd is happy they got to witness it. Yeah, and it was something where I don't know, and I don't necessarily... Next year is Minneapolis, right? Yes, I think. It's not... I I don't want ETU to go do a show in Minneapolis, but if it ends up that I know it's the the Struggles is the guy behind ETU, that if he has a hand into whatever is happening, Mania Weekend, and has some Dragon Gate involvement, I have all the faith in the world in that. And it's something that... For Dragon Gate, that's a great way for them to end their uh, WrestleMania weekend with. The thing that I would like to see going forward, and, and look, I, you know, I, I I get the impression from the people on the ETU side of things that I talked to yesterday that you know they want Dragon Gate back, and I would assume uh, I haven't talked to anybody on the Dragon Gate side, but I would assume that they all had a very good time on that show, and that they would be open, you know, financially if they could make it work to come back. The thing that I would want now is a Dragon Gate six man in front of the ETU crowd. I think that's the next chapter of this relationship is, you know, they had to really fight to win over that spring break crowd and they eventually did. But with with the level of respect that ETU has shown Dragon Gate, I think it'd be very, very nice uh, for a six man to eventually happen in that promotion. So fingers crossed that happens. Absolutely. It's something where I feel like you take that match from the GCW crowd, you put it in the H2O uh, training center in front of the ETU crowd. And we both were 
in the four, four and a quarter range. And I think you're very easily able to bump that one up just for pure environment alone. That was WrestleMania weekend for Dragon Gate. That was not the only thing happening in the Dragon System, though, cases. We had two shows happen back in Japan, one in Hamatsu, one in Yokosuka, closing out Ray de Parejas. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, re- so real quick, Mike, I'm going to cut you off. I don't have a lot of time. I've got about five minutes before I have okay. to hop off. Would you mind, can we combine Ray de Parejas with a Cork and preview? Because I think they go together. Yep. Let's do that. So... Are, I'm going to read through the Corkin lineup case, actually, and we can kind of give our thoughts then about Ray Day Prey House coming out of that. So Corkin will have happened probably by the time y'all have heard this. Big things going into it, coming out of Yokosuka, Susumu Mochizuki is returning to Susumu Yokosuka. Hey, that was very clearly now in retrospect done for M3K and for Junior, launching him off there. No problem there. But Yamato and Susumu Yokosuka face off against the second place team of the A block. It's Natural Vibes advancing through Big Boss Shimizu and Strong Machine J. And then Dragon Kid and Naruki Doi, no hug, go up against the second place team out of the B block. Uh, team Big Hug there. So it's no hug versus Big Hug. Shimizu and J versus uh, Yamato and Susumu to decide uh, Ray Day Parejas. Uh, you know, I can't wait for all of our predictions to be wrong by the time that that everybody hears this, but I got to think I got to think this is the Shimizu Strong Machine J tournament. Yeah, I feel like that it's something where like unless you're completely destroying natural vibes and just moving on from them, you need to have like one part of it that's going to at least have a little bit of hope going forward and it has to be Shimizu and J. So, I'm totally with you on that. Uh Yeah, because and- you know, I, at the very least Yamato and Susumu, I don't think they get anything out of being in the finals. I, you know, this is they they did. I got to listen back. I kind of think I nailed some of our initial Ray Day Parejas thoughts, though, because I I said no hug would get out. I said big hug wouldn't win, but they had a real shot to make the the semifinals, and that Yamato and Susumu would do very well. So I'm I'm proud of myself there. But there's no reason for Yamato and Susumu to be in the finals. Yeah, the only reason you could is like a week from now them going, hey, we like teaming for each other. Let's form a unit. Like yeah. that's that's really it there. So those are the two semifinals kicking off. Cork win going down the remainder of the card case, and we'll jump in because I think like we'll have some things to talk about in match four. But match three, uh, Kanda, Kondo, and Tomonaga versus Masaki, Mochizuki, Don Fuji, and Kagatora. Touch football there. Uh, eight man tag. We have D Courage, Madoka Kakuda, Dragon Daya. Ryoya Tanaka teaming up with Daiki Yanagiuchi versus Gold Class, Kota Minora, Benkei, and BB Hulk with Ria Fuda, Ultimo and Awashi versus Kai and Johnny, and then a six man vibes versus Z Bratz, KZ, UT, and Jackie Funky Kame versus Shun, Ishin, and his Korkin, uh, Z Bratz debut, Jason Lee. All right, well, I mean, we got to think Fuda's joining Gold Class, right? I mean, you kind you need to have it, or you need to be like Minorita's back. It has to be one of those two. Yeah, I'm with you. And I, in you know, judging from Minorita's last Instagram post, it seemed like there was progress being made, but I didn't get the vibe that he was ready to come back yet. So I'd be a little surprised if I saw that. I think with the hair, and I think you know, they, they were very clearly desperate to do something with Fuda the last time that he got healthy. I think they're they're going to continue that here, and whether it. It fits, I think, is a separate question, but I do think they just, they, they've got him healthy and they want to do something with him. And right now, that thing is going to be gold class for him. Yeah. And you have him kind of in contrast of Daiki, who is kind of almost at that point to do something with too, with that. And I, I, I guess Fuda and gold class, if that happens, it makes sense and it provides an element there. Like now you get a new fall post. You can have, you you don't have to be so reliant on Hulk to fill out things and you don't have to beat up Menor as much. Exactly. And then, uh, yeah, natural vibes versus Jason Lee and Zebrats there. I'm, I don't know if we get the cage match in Aichi, but it does feel like JFK and Jason Lee does feel like it's a plus is bound. I mean, look, Jason's teasing the scissors, on uh the the promos on the youtube uploads he's been tweeting you know just various percentages leading up to what will be a hundred percent at cork and hall so maybe i, I new would hear say it again maybe new gear a hundred percent 
that that's interesting i would think new gear and i would i i would i would assume we get new a look. challenge coming out of this because this is the last cork and before dead or alive oh yeah that is right because it's always the the useless kyoto show before dead or alive never in tokyo and nev but it's always right after that and looking at how the tv is real quick as now we're about to run out of time here it is something where you do have a lot of tv this month so you can kick off stuff on that road very easily here if you want to lay out some sort of a quest as if that's the route they're going to go yeah so i i think we get something big here i can't wait for the atmosphere i think it's going to be a crazy hot match i'm i'm really look the the expectation for the ray day perihas finale coming off of last year is a is a great match you know a, a dragon gate match the year contendership but i'm most excited to see what jason does in cork and hall yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm really looking forward to that Corquin Hall show, and we will have a review of that coming next week. Yeah, on and the I, show. sorry, I I know no one of these Corkins. We try to uh, get a little little sooner uh, of a record date, but I I will not have a day free until next Tuesday when we record. It's, so that is when we're going to do it. it it's one of those crazy times for both of us also so it, <laughs> it, 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 you, you, your life's going crazy i'm trying to like plan a garage on a wedding oh. so like yeah no it, we will be back next tuesday talking about this i'm gonna make sure to have the jcw and gcw match watch before then too so we, we'll talk about that then as well if if you would like to follow us you can follow us on twitter at open voice gate cases at underscore in your case i'm at fuji Heya. Thanks for listening to Open the Voice Gate. We'll be back with you next week. Take care, everyone. Hello there, everybody. It's me, Gary Kidney, the co-host of You've Got to Be Kidding Me on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. And I am Liam Jones, my full name, and I am also a part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network as a co-host, but you've got to be kidding me. We are a TNA history podcast that covers TNA one month at a time. We cover all the drama, all the matches, all the Vince Russo nonsense you could ever want in your life. Have you, you heard of TNA? I bet you have. But would it be funnier if two people made jokes over it the whole time? Probably. So if that sounds like fun to you, check it out on this very Voices of Wrestling podcasting network and Liam will do bits and whatnot.